Greetings, I'm the dentist. Welcome back to Dent Agenda. This is Chapter 3, Pediatric Dentistry. In this tutorial, we will discuss extraction versus restoration of primary teeth. Despite a welcome reduction in the prevalence of dental decay all around the world, the dilemma of whether to restore or extract a primary tooth is still all too familiar. In making a decision, a number of factors should be considered, including the age of your patient, medical history, motivation and cooperation of the parents, caries extent, pain, lesion extent, tooth position, permanent successor, present or absence, and malocclusion. And each of them will be discussed in details throughout this video. Starting with the age of the patient. This will influence the likely cooperation for multiple restorative procedures, trying to rescue or to fix the primary teeth. Also, the expected remaining length of service of the affected tooth and the severity of sequelae following early tooth loss as the earlier the tooth is lost, the greater the potential of space loss as well. Both will determine whether you're going to fix and restore the primary teeth or you're going to extract them. Number two, medical history. Some medical conditions are quite restricting for your treatment options. Some would require tooth restorations and some others will require tooth extraction, all for the sake of the patient's own good. For example, for patients with recurrent bacteremia, high caries increase risks, like in immunocompromised patients or in cases of endocarditis. It is generally considered that primary tooth pulp therapy should be completely avoided with extraction, taking appropriate precautions where necessary, often being more appropriate. So in these cases, extraction is your treatment option. Conversely, in haemophilias, for example, extractions should be completely avoided and the primary teeth should be preserved and restored if possible until their natural exfoliation. Number three, the motivation and cooperation of the parents. As it is the parents that bring the child to the dental service, we must explain to them the benefits of maintaining the primary dentition. Unfortunately, a small proportion of the population may regard a dentist that refills and restores primary teeth with suspicion. After all, everyone knows that baby teeth fall out, so why to restore them? So you should explain why restorative treatments are beneficial and lay down the risks of neglecting the problem on both the short and the long terms. Number four, the extent of caries. In a child with an otherwise caries-free mouth, every attempt should be made to preserve that intact condition that way. Where there is extensive caries, on the other hand, restorations of the restorable teeth, especially the ease, and loss of the unrestorable ones with space maintenance can be an acceptable compromise. Number 5. Pain. If a child is suffering pain from one or more teeth, this needs to be alleviated as soon as possible and definitely in the same visit. But if the child is symptom-free and not in pain, then the dentist will have more time to explore and investigate the extent of lesion or lesions and lay out a treatment plan. Also, the child's cooperation can be a limiting factor in what can be provided each time they visit. Number six, 
lesion extent. In primary molars, destruction of the marginal ridges indicate a high probability of pulpal involvement. If several primary molars require pulp therapy, and the cooperation or the motivation of the child is poor, serious thought should be given to extraction rather than restoration and, of course, space maintenance afterwards. Number 7. Tooth Position The position of the tooth can affect your decision on whether to extract the primary tooth or not. For example, early loss of primary incisors will have little to no effect on the art arrangement. On the other hand, extraction of the primary canine and molars will, in a crowded case, lead to localization of the crowding. Also, keep in mind that extraction of the ease, particularly in the upper arch, should be delayed if possible, until the six has erupted, so you will have a tooth to anchor the space maintainer around, to avoid space loss and premolar impaction. Number 8. The presence or absence of the permanent successor. Bear in mind that the amount of crowding present and the likelihood of spontaneous space closure after the permanent teeth eruption. Let's look at one case. The absence of permanent lower second premolar and hence retained primary second molar. If that retained primary second molar is in a good condition, it can be kept and crowned to reach the occlusal table as the adjacent teeth until it naturally exfoliates due to increased occlusal forces, where it can then be replaced by a bridge work or a dental implant around the age of 18. Another case, presence of permanent successor, but there is crowding and it is not fully erupted. You can consider orthodontic treatment to allow for its eruption or it can be extracted, if indicated. Last but not least, number 9, malocclusion. If still undecided after all, it is worth considering occlusion. In a particularly crowded case, restoration of a decayed tooth may be indicated if farther space loss would mean that extraction of more than one premolar per quadrant would be required. Much has been discussed about compensating and balancing extractions. Compensating means the same tooth in the opposing arches, so upper and lower. Balancing means contralateral tooth, meaning same tooth on the right and left. Compensating and balancing extractions are still an area of some controversy till now. The rational is that a symmetrical problem is easier to deal with later on, but if taken to its logical conclusion, suppose there is gross caries in D and E. If you are going to follow the guidelines of contralateral and compensating extractions, that will result in clearance. So it depends on the situation and it can be handled later on without compromising extracting sound teeth. In general, loss of primary canines in a crowded patient should be balanced, so you should extract the other canine, the contralateral canine, on the left or the right, to avoid and prevent center line shifting. Balancing Ds in a child with increased risk of caries also has some advantages. It removes the very caries-prone contacts which are between the E and D, and between D and C. So much for theory, but in practice, it should be remembered that a happy and cooperative patient is more important in the long term. When treating a child under local anesthesia, leaving extractions unbalanced and uncompensated, and monitoring for center line shift may be preferable to prolonging intervention in the dental chair. 
And there you have it all, guiding you to make a decision that you know is right. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I'd like to have you here for more videos. And follow us on Instagram at Dented Gender for extra tips and tricks.